The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer-to-peer. Good morning. Good morning, buddy. How's it going, man? It's great, man. How about yourself? Good, good, good. Chill. Other than, other than the Twitter, the flame wars with uh, Samurai. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's all good. It's fun to roll in the mud every now and then. You know, you know yeah. how it is. I, um, I'm probably a minority opinion here, but I kind of think it's a good thing that there's there's a forum to express those those ideas. But to me, like incumbent upon being kind of rough around the edges on social media is that in real life, you need to be willing to come to have like a very polite, real conversation with people. And like you need to be willing to dial it back, you know, like, all right, all right, we've talked enough shit. Let's like let's talk about some real stuff. I'm not actually like that terrible of a person, you know, like right. if all you can do is sit there and flame and then be pissed off all the time, like y- you have to balance that with also being a reasonable person. I couldn't agree with you more, man. And it must be very, exo- like I said, it must be very exhausting from their from their standpoint, right? I mean, to just be in that that flame mode 24 seven. Uh, yeah, it's not, not, say, not, not a way you, to live uh, when you take the whole like business aspect into account and that they're VC funded and all this, you know, it's a business they're making money. It does make sense why there's such like some of these people um, in the the samurai community are like hypocrites because like like here we go we got we got bill sorry sorry to interrupt tux we got bill you You are missing the point douglas why do you red carpet i didn't red carpet (laughs) i had the guy on my show now was i like super well versed in wasabi and samurai to be the best person for grilling him no i was not i absolutely was not and i i've stated that uh, but then the samurai reaction is, or T Dev's that reaction is, Tuman's a fucking dolt. He's a fucking idiot. He had this guy on, and he was, he didn't do his research. I had him on the show. We talked. My my research was having him on the show, and I got his point of view. And then I'm more than happy to have the other point of view. Come on the show, Bill Paragi. Jump on and tell us all about it. I don't know. Find somebody else, and I'll do a, I'll do a thorough Monero talk with them. From the standpoint of why wasabi wallet sucks but don't sit here and crucify me for having a guy on a podcast that's about digital cash who built an app that's being used for bitcoin privacy tech right i'm sure it has its flaws we know it has its flaws samurai wallet i'm sure comes with with some flaws as well right it's not it's not a perfect piece of technology Monero, we know, is not a perfect piece of technology either. Um, but yeah, I didn't red carpet the guy. Um, you cover your ass saying it's about free speech. It is about free speech, man. Or, you know, it's about me. Want that I, I, I run the Monero Talk podcast. I gotta have whoever the fuck I want on the show. <laughs> you don't have you don't have to listen to it. You don't have to watch it. You don't have to gauge in it. I know it pisses Something. you off that, that I had your competitor on the show. But just beat them on the merits. Beat them on the merits. You're Sounds more like than gatekeeping to me. Yeah, it's it's it like extreme. It's like it's like what are they hiding? What are they so afraid of? Listen, I wouldn't want to go up against the samurai devs, and although I'm not a developer, um, you know, I consider myself like a somewhat advanced pleb. I, I wouldn't want to have to debate those guys. <laughs> like they're they're pretty smart. Um, I don't think I'd even want to debate the wasabi guys. I, I mean, also I don't really. You know, I understand the basics of their protocol, but I wouldn't really want to have to debate them on the specifics of their implementation or which is better or anything like that. So I can understand why people sort of back down from them because um, these guys, like, they do take the time to go out there. Like, when they're flaming on Twitter, they also... One thing I do like about them is they do a good job of kind of, like, talking shit while also, like, bringing the technical arguments. But, yeah, I mean, at that level, like, those guys are so far above our pleb level. (laughs) Like, how, how do we know? Like, how the fuck do I know which of these guys is the best privacy or if either of them are even good privacy at all? So it really is just incumbent upon them to have a conversation with their competitors in front of everybody. Because, uh, like, how, how do any of us really know? We just don't. Like, we're plebs, you know, please come on the show and explain it to us in terms we can understand and then debate each other, right, so that we can see how you comport yourselves and, and see what kind of arguments you bring. And, and then, uh, you know, talk to our smart guys and we can be like, all right, Monero smart guys, what did y'all take away from this stuff from from a debate? But don't just like don't just gatekeep 
and, and say, oh, you're you're not allowed to have other people on the show or we're going to talk shit about you because you had someone on the show. Like, it's not like he brought Craig fake Satoshi right on, on Monero <laughs> talk or anything. Right. Please. It's 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 a widely used app. I mean, I guess maybe it shouldn't be. Maybe it's a lot more nefarious than I understand. But it seems to be that most people that, you know, it's kind of common knowledge out there, I guess, of what Wasabi is is doing. So I guess it's up to people if they want to if they want to use it or not. Um, but they're saying, I don't know, that it, it, it's a lot more nefarious than we understand that it's it's actually you know, Wasabi is is in cahoots with law enforcement and and all and all this stuff, which that that's fine, guys. Go 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 fight that battle. I just had the guy on my show, um, and yeah, I don't, I don't know what to on tell both you. Both sides on both sides of this argument. So, like, maximalists basically hate um, uh, samurai. That maximalists, for whatever reason, just really really dislike samurai. But it seems like there's a whole bunch of stuff to dislike about Wasabi and, and like, okay, let's subtract the personal stuff from it and just talk about the tech. Like there's criticism that goes around both sides all the time. How the hell do I know which of them to use? It seems like everyone tends to respect Monero. Even people that don't like it are still kind of like, yeah, the privacy is still pretty good, but it's a shit coin. Okay, mm -hmm. whatever. But at least the privacy works. No one can even agree on whether Samurai or Wasabi works. So why take the chance? And oh, by the way, we kind of learned with Tornado Cash that gaining profit by providing a mixing platform is kind of dangerous territory. Um, I'm not mm. saying anything will happen there, but man, you body, know, you're, body you're you with... you you status cuck you are you are oh, you accusing shit. are you accusing samurai? Of... <laughs> like that, that, would, that would that would be, that would be the response to that one. Like how dare you even suggest that? Like yeah, no that that that's fact. That that's so, facts, I, was, guys. I was agreeing with your um just like off of the whole the whole business thing earlier because it seems like. A lot of the people in the, like, especially the T Div guy, it seems he's like so hypocritical where he's like this big bad boy cypherpunk, but then shits on other projects and other people that are pushing the envelope forward with competing, which not really competing, but for their business competing products like Monero. Um, and other people that, you know, have people on the show who are competing with them. Uh, and I know they have, it was the, the BTC to XMR swaps, right? So they do have that. So, uh, they're not totally like anti Monero or anything, but it, I know that I know they kind of were before and they've, they backed off of that now, but it does seem super hypocritical that they're super gatekeepy and they totally attack like so many individuals in the space who are just doing effectively the same thing they are is trying to push privacy products, but you know, can't possibly have something competing if all their goal is to just make money off of this because they're making money off of a broken player. system basically and they're they're able to make i guess a decent amount of money off of it mm, that's exactly. an interesting point yeah that's that's the point i'm trying to make yeah they're they're making money off of uh selling a way to, to wash your your bitcoin bitcoin is you know that doesn't function well as as a privacy tool so they make their money off offering a way for people to to clean clean their bitcoin and so you know the Monero is competition with them in that respect because if everybody's using Monero, there's no, no need, need to wash your Bitcoin. To wash your Bitcoin. Yeah. A a for profit company who makes money off of washing people's Bitcoin. Every time you go and use Samurai, you're paying fees to a company called Samurai. They make money off of you because Bitcoin is a surveillance tool. Well, what is more interesting to me is the VC funding because we've seen what's happened to VC funded privacy companies in the past. Um, right. And what's, what's most concerning about that is they claim to not be VC funded. Do we know which VCs? Uh, 1031 and Cypherpunk Holdings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are the two recent ones. Yeah. Hmm. Any big names associated? Um, yeah. 1031 is, uh, what's his name? Matt. Uh, what's that guy's name? Mm. Let me let me let me just do a Let's screen see. share for a sec. Hold on a sec. Can I can I do a One. screen share here? Mm -hmm. Yep. Let me pull up. Do here. I need to stop mine? Yeah. Because right now I'm screen sharing. I mean, not live, but you know, in my personal. Oh, okay, never mind. Yeah. One so. small point is that um, the the atomic swaps that they do that Samurai does with Monero are for their docs exchange. It's like kind of your, I don't understand the implementation, but it's your leftover change from after doing the mixing. 
um, that's not really straightforward to mix again. So you, they they implemented an atomic swap to Monero so that they could. Um, oh, Marty Bent, Jesus, it's Marty Bent. Marty Bent N- knows because he invested in that VC. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so 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 Vic is is a part owner of Samurai Wallet. I mean, I believe Marty Bent was um, he was one of the promoters of oh, what was what was one of the big uh, exchanges or one of the big bankruptcies of twenty twenty two. It was one of the first ones. Uh, I can't remember their name anymore. Already relegated to the to uh, forgotten <laughs> the forgotten bankruptcies. God, what was it called? It was one of the major bankruptcies that a lot of the maximalists had shilled. Doesn't matter. So yeah, here, here if you go on the Samurai page, we are privacy activists. We are privacy active, activists who have dedicated our lives to creating the software that Silicon Valley will never build, the regulators will never allow, and the VCs will never invest in. You guys are VC. You guys have VC investors. You got right. I mean, like, like how? Like that's that's literally your about section on your on your on your page. I mean, that's like that's very deceitful. To, to be I, fair, Marty he, Bent he, isn't exactly like a tradfi VC. He's you know he he's a Bitcoin maximalist that kind of you know got popular with his with his podcast and then um, with his buddy. They they funded different projects. Um, yeah, sure, but you know you're you you have investors that you have to answer to, right? Yeah, yeah, you, that's true. It's your your like for community funded your for profit company, and then here let's look at this one. Then we have Cypherpunk Holdings. Let's bring that. Let's bring that up. That's their other investor, Cypherpunk Holdings. Investing in the Bitcoin ecosystem. I don't know who's behind them, but if you go down, and it shows who up, oh, look who they're invest, look who they've invested in: Samurai Wallet and Wasabi Wallet. That's that's incredible, guys. That's so funny. <laughs> they so they are owned. They are one of the companies that controls their company. Also has a say in Wasabi Wallet as part of the like they, they, you know. So I mean, the like fucking... the black rock of crypto. Yeah, uh, they own all of these companies, even ones that are competing directly with each other. And then they have in their statement, "We will never. Uh, the regulators will never allow, and the VCs will never invest in." There's a VC firm invested in them that's invested in their competitor, their competitor that's aligned with the chain analysis companies. So is Samurai Wallet effectively aligned with the chain analysis companies too? If you, if you, you know, if you take that logic that far, I mean, it's just fucking ridiculous. They should change their about section and they should change their, their marketing and the things they say because they're effectively lying to people. So, you know, they got good tech, but they're lying to people. Uh, and the other point is too, we will net Silicon Valley will never build. The regulators will never allow. One of the things that this turned into is criticism of Monero, calling Monero a status coin, a status project. Uh, you know, saying they bring up comply first. I don't know if you guys remember what that was, mm-hmm. but it never it never gained traction. But it was this idea that there was a group that was going to try to in Monero that was, I guess, going to try to deal with regulators and whatnot. And I don't know, maybe try to help, uh, exchanges figure out how to, how to legally add Monero, whatever, whatever it may be. But yes, um, Samurai wallet would, would never participate in anything like that. But I mean, here you have them here. Here we go. Samurai wallet strike and others ask FinCEN to withdraw pro- proposed rules tied to crypto mixing. So here it was Samurai Wallet working with Strike, who's like the most KYC, pro KYC crypto company that exists, right? Strike like, is the most like status company in all of the Bitcoin ecosystem. Like, so here's Samurai one. Wallet teaming up with Strike to write a letter to the regulators, pleading with them, saying, please don't regulate us. That doesn't sound very cypherpunk to me. 
that doesn't things, sound like things, things, like the like the ultimate cypherpunks. And I get it. You're a company. You're doing what you got to do, which is fine. But then don't market yourself like you're not. You're not some group of cypherpunks building some decentralized privacy tech system. You're a for-profit company that's teaming up with companies in the space that you criticize for being pro KYC, for being pro chain analysis, you're literally teaming up with them to plead to regulators to ask them for permission. You don't get less cypherpunk than that. So, I mean, that's fine. I get, do what you gotta do, but don't act like you're something else. I want to I want to speak for a second on that comply first thing because that thing gets a lot of shit from people who don't even know what it was. The name is really really bad. It was literally just a group designed to show centralized exchanges that hey you can use privacy coins with the existing regulation in place. It was not designed to make Monero or any other crypto project more compliant. It was designed to show that you can while following AML KYC stuff, you can have privacy coins because privacy coins have been constantly demonized and removed and they want to make it more available. But that thing ended up falling through completely and multiple people pulled out of it anyway because it just it didn't end up going through. And, and the name was really, really, really bad. The name scared a lot of people away because Comply First doesn't make sense. And, um, and Comply First is not Monero, right? It was a group. No, it's not Monero. It's just a coalition was... of multiple people and multiple groups. And this is the reason that the Gabriel Custodiette guy, uh, one, one of the, the concerns he had with the one, he wouldn't specify anything else, is this Comply First thing that Cake was a part of years ago. But Cake pulled out of it uh, due to concerns themselves. They pulled out of it. But once again, to reiterate, it has nothing to do with compliance. It's just showing companies that you can, with your existing infrastructure, have privacy coins that was it that was right it. that, that was like the the, the coe white paper that that the community uh actually i think it was like fluffy pony and others funded they yeah had, yep um, fluffy pony was the the guy who mainly started that if i remember correctly right yeah the, the coe white paper was basically a law uh you know big time law firm that came out with the paper basically saying it's perfectly legal for exchanges in the u.s to have monero should we have not gone that route? Should we have not t told the exchanges that it's legal to have Monero giving plebes access to digital cash? Like, what's wrong with that? We all, we all, we all, you know, we actually, we, all, we obviously all agree that the best way to obtain Monero is without KYC. Um, but yeah, no one disagrees with that. No one and disagrees this with that. guy, he gets mad when people suggest using centralized exchange get Monero. he gets mad when people like he was he was calling a bunch of people xmr compliance fruits because they were all glad that binance delisted monero he's such a hypocrite no matter what way you do it you're you're just like an xmr compliance fruit i mean look, look at this picture it's literally a fruit shake in a blender <laughs> You don't get more compliance fruit than this samurai wallet teaming up with strike to write letters to FinCEN. That's as compliance fruity as you fucking get. Just keep just keep it up there, guys. <laughs> let, 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 let the people see. Am I am I am I misinterpreting this? Is this is this wrong? Am I am I off base no. somewhere? No, I think they're just, just... they're just trolls, and they have a business. They want to sell a product, and they don't want competition. I think really that's it. That's what it mostly boils down to. And then they have their group, you know, like um people that are on the end. They have to like follow their uh their general consensus on interacting with certain people. Uh, like what? What would Gabriel Custodian say about this? That Samurai Wallet teamed up with Strike, and some of the the other most KYC pro KYC firms in the space to uh, to write to the regulators and plead with them. How is that not the equivalent of comply first? What, what, yeah, what I mean, well, I'll never find out because I I basically I did an episode with this guy a couple months ago. Um, like and part of it was me talking about Monero stuff. Part of it was me talking about cake stuff. And then a couple days before he was going to release it, he brought up uh, the comply first thing and I explained it to him. And then I was like, okay, any, anything else? And he, he 
just blankly said that Cake doesn't align with his values, so he will not go forward with the episode. Blah blah blah. And then I I pressed him like, hey, what 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 are you concerned about? What are these concerns? Wouldn't give me any information at all. Nothing. And then he ended up just out of the blue, just blocking me completely on Twitter, uh, and blocking Cake account too. So just like totally, totally, just like a backdoor thing. It's like it's almost like he was, you know, the Tito guy was like telling him to like, hey, you can't, you can't. You can't involve cake now. You can't do do episode with them. It's not okay. It, it was yeah, him. It was like him not around telling him no. Yeah, it was him not having the balls to talk to you because he was scared that Big Daddy T Dev was going to yell at him. That's exactly what it was, and that's what they do in this cult, the T Dev cult. He has everybody licking his boots because they're 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 they're, they're terrified of them because if anyone speaks out they get they get fucking crucified it's like it's like worse than the btc maxi crowd i was gonna say isn't this the the standard the go-to tactics strategy of uh of bitcoiners bitcoin maximalists 100 percent we've seen over and over again which is funny because he's been attacked like ruthlessly by the maximalists or i mean just samurai in general has been attacked so much by bitcoin maximalists Maybe he's uh, traumatized, you know, so hurt people hurt people. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. He's, he's definitely a hurt person. You know, with the compliance right. stuff, I think it's really interesting how it's not about the regulations. It's very clearly not about the regulations because um, there, there was that paper uh, the, about Monero and about how compliant, like you can be compliant with Monero. And then there's other information, even from government sources itself, um, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency of the United States, which is like the lead regulator for United States banks. They had said back in 2020, I believe it was 2020, they said that um, that that even anonymity enhanced cryptos um, could be compliant. Um, they effectively made a comparison to cash and said that they have robust procedures in place um, for financial institutions to be able to comply. And so it's it's not about the regulations. It's about the effect uh, of of what Monero and what true privacy does to their sort of deep state systems, to their to the things that they don't admit out out in the open. The, it, Monero defeats a lot of that, and so it's it it has to be removed, right? It has to be taken off of Binance. It's probably going to get delisted across Europe. Um, and so it's like okay, it's it's not about the regulations. It's it's about whether or not they can spy on you. And the regulations are just the excuse, you know, they got millions of them. So that's, that's just the excuse that they can insert um, to create a narrative when they need to. If you find yourself uh, a, quote, you, a quote unquote privacy tech advocate, you're part of the samurai clan cult, and you're out there calling Venero a statist project, you've completely lost the fucking plot. You are working for a for-profit company that washes Bitcoin, that offers people a service for cleaning Bitcoin because Bitcoin does not work as a privacy tool. So you're promoting this for-profit company while bashing a truly decentralized cypherpunk money and calling it statist. You have completely lost the fucking plot. As you can see here, if you go to the website, complyfirst.org, you can actually see what this was about. And it was only about showing existing companies that you can use privacy coins while it, you know, working with the existing regulation. And furthermore, users of transparent networks such as Bitcoin and Ethereum may also adopt certain privacy functionality that compliance professionals and regulators need to account for. So, you know... There's a lot of, you know, unfortunately, much of the discourse on privacy proving cryptocurrency is called by lack of deep and nuanced technical understanding of these projects, which can differ significantly from better understood public ledger projects as a Bitcoin and Ethereum. Without knowledge of the full workings, capabilities of such products, it becomes difficult to provide concrete and actual guidance to compliance professional regulators. So it was basically um, these these companies just didn't want to deal with the privacy coins because they, they didn't know how to... They're scared of it because, you know, privacy, blah, blah, blah. But then they also don't know how to deal with it with their existing system. So it was really just a thing to try and get privacy coins um, to be accepted more in the mainstream. And obviously no one, no one is saying, no one is saying that getting KYC coins is the best. But 
getting KYC privacy coin is still better than getting a KYC Bitcoin, right? So at the end of yeah, the day, I don't, I don't, I don't see how you could disagree with that. Um, it's like taking cash out of a bank. Is it better to get the cash peer to peer? Sure. The bank, so the bank doesn't even know, like you have it, but when you, you take the cash out of the bank, they don't know what you do with it afterwards. And so you're getting some freedom there. Is it the most ideal way? No, but it is an on-ramp for people who maybe aren't ready for the most ideal way yet. And it doesn't matter. It's all moot. I mean, Monero is being delisted from all, all major exchanges. And here we are, uh, you know, we're, we're moving along. I mean, you don't get le less status than that. Uh, Monero is the complete opposite. It's the most hated coin by governments. And the Monero community is taking it in stride, embracing it, and now building tech that will allow us to exist outside of the fiat system. I think Samurai, I'm pretty sure I've heard them brag about how no Samurai mixed coin has ever been rejected from an exchange. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know if they still brag about that, but they definitely have in the past. I mean, yeah, once again, here's me not knowing enough, but isn't it, cl isn't it known that a coin was previously coin joined? Like it's, it's known, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's more so the Samurai implementation is that it's a large pool and you can't know which coin. It's kind of like Tornado Cash in a way. It's like just a huge pool. So when coins come out, you can't be sure if that was like the first coin that went in or the most recent coin that went in. Whereas coin join is more limited in its implementation where you you have a certain number of peers. You do this mixing, some kind of round number of rounds of mixing. And then at the end, um, supposedly, you can't unwind it. Um, there's been... There's been a number of articles and a number of criticisms that you can actually unwind it. I think probably only only the people that really understand this stuff would be able to tell you yes or no on that one. Hmm. Once again, guys, any samurai experts that are willing to uh, you know, come up here and talk like 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 a gentleman or a gentle lady, you're you're more than welcome. Tell us tell us the info without you know berating us you're more than welcome to use this platform for that all right buddy let's let's get into price report otherwise we'll be here all day okay uh oh run the intro for our our sponsors cake wallet oh yeah good call good call oh is that in the price report segment one also or which one yeah yeah R run the price report segment. all right go let's ahead The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. All right, price report take two. Hopefully, we All can right. talk about price this time. Yes, and also smash the like, please. We got we got fifty two watching in the YouTube comments, or fifty two watching on YouTube Live, and only five upvotes. I don't know how that works. Maybe it's uh, maybe YouTube. Show maybe it's showing us all the people that are watching over New Pipe. And by the way, for those of you that don't know, if you don't want to give all of your data to YouTube, you can use New Pipe. You don't have any advertisements. Um, although you can't uh, you can't comment on videos and you know shit post comment on videos. Somehow YouTube appears to have blocked me from commenting sometimes, most of the times. Anyways, but yeah, smash the like and be happy. Okay, so uh, let's start with, uh, I guess, with Bitcoin. We've talked about Bitcoin, so might as well start here. We are looking at the regression analysis. I republished this this week. Um, I also updated, improved this script in a number of ways. And you'll notice um, that we have the uh, we have the extrapolation here. You'll notice I changed the colors. So I decided red belongs on the top, right? Because that's like, oh shit, we're getting, you know, there's a lot of price action here where maybe it's getting dangerous. Uh, and then green is at the bottom, you know, because green is soft and lovely. And this is where you got to buy because uh, this is where you're going to make your money is at this green line. And then uh, this used to be yellow. The blue line was yellow. Now it's blue because it's like yellow feels like, oh, danger, you know, be careful, slow down. But actually, um, the way that <laughs> in some ways, the fact that TradingView booted my last script kind of... Um, it made me improve this script somewhat. I took the time to actually improve it in, in, in various ways. Um, one of the ways in the description, I realized that the way that you're going to use this chart 
you should DCA into Bitcoin at or below the blue line. Like if we're at or below the blue line, you really should just be buying. Um, at least, you know, from a long term perspective, like that's the thing to do. And then once we get to somewhere within, say, 20 percent of this red line, that's when you want to be DCAing, DCAing out of Bitcoin. Um, so, yeah, I published this thing. It's available for anyone. All you have to do is type in uh, so forward slash Bitcoin regression. And hopefully today I can spell correctly. Right. So you can just uh, Bitcoin regression price boundaries. And uh, that's my script there. So uh, if you double click on it, what you can do is change your line width, you know, just standard stuff. And then you can also tell it how many years for do you want this thing to extrapolate? Right. So you could type in 10 years and then this thing is going to extrapolate, you know, even further out. So one thing that's kind of weird about this script. Um, so TradingView doesn't provide a straightforward way, at least not that I'm aware of, to extrapolate a function. So what you have to do is like you have to tell it to calculate some number of days in advance and then use you have to convert everything to Unix time and then convert it back to bars. And then you have to do an offset somehow as an artifact of the way that works. Um, notice that there's this big gap here, right? This gap might show up for you. What you have to do is actually scroll back to the place where the offset starts. It's, just, it's weird. Uh, I wanted to complain at TradingView, but they just don't care. But notice now that that gap filled in. You have to like actually see the candle where the offset begins. So if you're offsetting like 10 years in the future, you might have to scroll back here a little bit to, to get that to fill in. Kind of just a weird artifact of, I don't know, something about TradingView. I've complained many times before about various things. They don't care. <laughs> so, um, But, you know, they're still the best thing out there. Like there is no platform as good as TradingView. PineScript sucks ass, but it's still better than anything else that exists. So what are you going to do? You're going to use PineScript. That's what you're going to do. Unless you're like, I don't know, in some kind of advanced trading firm where you actually like have all of your own data and you store it on your own servers and you can do all of your own cool um, Python analysis, whatever. Okay, so anyways, um, yeah, just wanted to show you guys this. This is republished now. Uh, we're basically above the, um, some people like to call this the fair price line or the non-bubble Bitcoin uh, line. One thing you can see here is that the green line and the, and the, the red lines will intersect in about 2037. Um, so it'll be interesting. This thing is going to break down. This regression analysis will break down, but you know, for short term horizons for something like the two to four year time horizon, this is probably pretty good. It's, it's useful for us. So, um, yep, that's, that's published. Um, enjoy. Hopefully, uh, hopefully some people get some use out of it. Uh, let's, let's now, uh, pivot here to Monero for a little bit. Uh, this is the, the Monero, Monero talk after all. Uh, unfortunately, you know, as usual, there's not much to talk about when it comes to Monero price. We've suffered a little bit of a decline with the rest of the pullback on the markets that happened, um, over the past week or so. Uh, we had talked the last week about, uh, we, we talked last week about expecting the pullback in general to continue for Bitcoin and, and thus for the rest of crypto. So Monero has also pulled back somewhat, but on slightly happier horizons, we can look at the Bitcoin Monero ratio. And so we've been, you know, we kind of been saying, hey, back here, we said, hey, this is kind of the beginning of uh, what might be a bottoming pattern, right? This is um, this is bullish divergence on the RSI. Let's just pull up the RSI here. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so we've got the RSI. Um, and so the RSI has been making higher lows, whereas price has been making lower lows. And in like traditional pleb level uh, technical analysis is analysis T leaves reading. This is what you call bullish divergence. And this is definitely a bottoming pattern from a technical standpoint. So you'll notice that surprise, surprise, as the Bitcoin price has pulled back, the Monero, uh, the Monero to Bitcoin ratio has gone up somewhat. And we talked about this last week, um, or maybe it was two weeks ago. Effectively, we ran the core or is it core relation analysis this is the wrong way to spell it. I do this even by myself. <laughs> you guys have no idea how many times I've sat here and been like, where the fuck is the indicator? Scratch my head for a minute and be like, oh, wait, yeah, of course, I'm, I'm bad at spelling. And anyone that follows me on Twitter <laughs> knows how bad I am at spelling. I don't know. Uh, anyways, kind of makes it difficult uh, <laughs> as someone who does uh, light programming. Um, but at least with programming, you get like little highlights and stuff that tell you that it's spelled wrong. Anyways, um, so yeah, correlation coefficient, which is the, uh, the the blue bars down here. So you'll notice effectively, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, that the Monero to Bitcoin ratio is anti-correlated with Bitcoin's price and with the total crypto market cap. So as the total crypto market cap goes up, the ratio of Monero to Bitcoin goes down. 
Uh, and it's this is like a very, very striking anti-correlation. And it basically tells you that, um, yeah, uh, I mean, for all the reasons we've talked about before, nefarious people in the background, most likely trying to prevent visibility of Monero. They don't want you buying Monero. They didn't get it for free. They don't like that it defeats their chain analysis, uh, which is lucrative for them on a number of fronts, not just the compliance front, but also on the we know where the funds are flowing in cryptocurrency front before the plebs do. And so we can front run that. Front running is like the name of the game uh, when it comes to um, to insider crypto trading, crypto dealings. Um, these guys will always have the information before the regular people do. That's just the nature of it. That's going to be true in traditional TradFi markets as well. Um, one thing that's interesting about just kind of as a sidetrack here, there's so many regulations that exist in TradFi markets. And the goal is to try and prevent a lot of these um, sort of unfair advantages that happen for players like the market makers in traditional markets or the um, or the brokerage firms, right? Because if you're a brokerage firm and you're connecting buyers and sellers, you have an unfair advantage in the sense that you see the order book, you know where funds are flowing, you've got insider information that no one else could have. And so there's all these regulations to try and prevent prevent them from using that, uh, that information. It really, it just, it creates a situation where insiders have to do a lot more monkey dancing uh, or dick dancing to get around um, those regulations in such a way that uh, you know they won't be prosecuted or whatever. Um, but make no mistake, those kinds of shenanigans still happen in the traditional finance markets. It's just significantly more complex and obscured, so that they can that they can have some kind of plausible deniability if they were in a court setting. Um, whereas in cryptocurrency, like there are very few regulations against that kind of stuff. And it seems moreover that nobody actually cares that much. Um, so it's like the rule, this kinds of like manipulations, you know, wash trading, front running, um, painting the tape, spoofing every trick in the book that was developed, you know, for the last hundred years or so in tr traditional markets for which regulations were created. Uh, crypto has just reinvented all of that on a shorter time horizon. So, um, <clears throat> but you know, markets are manipulation. This is one of the first things. If you want to trade, you better understand it. Markets are manipulation. There are insiders. There are whales. Um, there are whales that feed on other whales, right? Not all whales are the same size. Just understand that it's a dirty, dirty place out there, and you better get used to it because it's not going to change anytime soon. So don't cry about it. Understand it. Learn it. And then um, see if you can uh, you know, use that to your advantage. So anyways, um, yeah, we've had a lot of negative action on Monero versus Bitcoin for quite a while, um, but this looks like a bombing pattern. Oh no, tab just crashed. Man, I've been having tab crashes lately. I don't know what the hell is going on. Um, let's try and restore that. At least it restored quickly. Um, okay, okay. Let's see here. Uh, let's look at the the uh, the price divergences. There's actually nothing to look at here. Basically, oscillating around the zero point. This is kind of what you expect. This is also the absolute price divergence. It's not the volume weighted. I didn't get into um, beefing up this script. Um, I will do it at some point. It's it's man. It's it's like. It's like homework. It, there, there's, there's, it's not like there's an interesting thing being developed. Oh, cool. You know, this, this, and that. It's like, you've got to just like, like a drone, like go through, okay, we got to add this ticker and then that ticker and then that ticker. And probably I'm going to misspell it like, you know, 20 times. Uh, anyway, so I'll eventually get, in, get around to beefing up the skip script and republishing it. It's not that big a deal because I'm not really sure how much it tells us, but maybe it will be revealing once I finally add all of the XMR USDT pairs XMR USDC and all the different stable coins out there across all the exchanges and really, 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 truly sum up the volume uh, as it exists, at least on the centralized exchanges for which we have reporting here on TradingView. Um, other than that, there is you know same story with the XMR versus ETH um, price. Again, this is probably some kind of long term bottoming pattern. That doesn't mean it's turning around tomorrow. That doesn't mean it's going to be turning around even next month. But long term, this is this is kind of the bottom. This is accumulation zone territory. It could go on for months, right? That could last for months. So don't um, you know, don't uh, don't 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 think that I'm trying to tell you that that's turning around here. That that's a profitable trade to be made in the short term. Uh, it would just be broadly regarded as accumulation. Um, you know, one thing that I forgot about this uh, to to mention here on the the um, the regression analysis. I also made this script so that you could you could do like you can use any Bitcoin chart now, um, right? So it still works. It used to be the case that you needed to use the BLX chart. I, I told you guys previously you have to use BLX or it's not going to be correct. I fixed that. Um, it's properly oriented around Unix time now, so, so the calculation is done no matter which chart it works. It works properly, so you can you can use that on any chart and you can use it on any oddball time frame. Like we could go to the two day chart and it'll still work for you. Um, except for that weird gap thing I told you about. So uh, yeah, the this script is nice and, and beefy now, should be good, should be useful. And 
there's like a master's thesis written about it. Not exactly, um, but the, the publishing requirements, they want you to really, really explain your script. Uh, okay, so anyways, uh, putting that aside, this right here is the one hour Bitcoin USD chart. Um, actually, let's zoom out. Let's go to the daily um, for a minute just so we can get our bearings. I always like to, to start big and then zoom in. Um, so we're looking here at the Bitcoin USD price chart. We've got the, our purple bands here. This is really, really is my target. Um, you know, for a long time, the blue lines were my target. Um, as, as we got to that area and things, the macro still looked bullish. We still had money in the reverse repos. You know, there was still liquidity flowing. It was, Hey, you know, the game is still on. The direction is still up. You know, after this pullback, um, showed that it wasn't going to be that much like the direction was up, especially after we got back into these blue bands here. Um, and so for the meantime, like <clears throat> I still tend to think, you know, and, and it's it's like the farther up you go, the more dangerous it gets to to say that we're going to keep on going. It's easy just to be like we're going up and up and up and up and be like, well, I was right 90 percent of the time. And OK, that was the top. Oops. Right. And be like, well, but I was right most of the time. Yeah. But you were wrong at the most critical moment, which was the top. Um, at least that's kind of. That's kind of the way I think about it, especially in terms of um, the way I like to trade, which is you know trying to sell the top. Um, I did actually exit um, one of my shitcoin positions recently. Um, took some very very nice profits on that. Um, it was kind of one of those situations where I was asking myself, okay, could it go higher? Yeah, potentially. Um, if I lose what I have now, would it be more painful to lose that, or more painful to watch the market continue pumping and I sold? And I said, well. If I lose what I just made, like that will be more painful <laughs> than than to watch the markets uh, continue pumping and miss out on some extra gains. So I basically sold that position. Um, OK, so basically these purple bands here is kind of what I'm looking at. That's really, really, really where I would where I would be top calling. Uh, it would be tentative, right? Who the hell knows if it's the top or not? Like it's not like we're hitting the top of the regression band or anything. Um, but this would be like my my point, like hitting this area right here is like if I'm wrong. And the Bitcoin price just goes stratospheric, parabolic. You will almost certainly have an opportunity to rebuy at 84,000 or 80,000. Bitcoin will pull back at some point to the 80,000 level, almost certainly, um, if it decides to just continue pumping. Um, but it's also a reasonably good chance, a good spot to say, hey, that that could be a top. There could be a longer washout here, you know, down to maybe the 40,000. Who knows? Even 30,000, right? Um, so it's kind of the same logic that I had in 2021 where I said, OK, can I be certain this, that this is the top? No, I don't know. But will I almost certainly if I'm wrong, will I almost certainly have the opportunity to rebuy at the same level that I'm selling? And the answer to that question was yes. And since the downside risk was so great, it just seemed like a no brainer. I was like, no, this is like the game theory on this means sell. And I thought, man, if I understand that, if I like if that's really, truly the case for me here. There have to be other very smart people that know this as well, other corporations that know this as well. Um, and, you know, sure enough, that turned out to be basically the top, right? 60,000 ish. Okay, so let's zoom in here to the one hour on Bitcoin chart. Um, yeah, so we basically continue pulling back, as we said last week, to, to, to expect to continue pulling back um, for the rest of the week, that there was, there was probably a, another down leg here to happen. Um, at this moment, looking on the short term chart, the one hour chart, uh, the statistical levels. Uh, basically, the short term lower standard deviation bands. So these bands right here, um, the, the orange bands, basically price appears to be stabilizing, um, kind of found some support down there. And then uh, right now is sort of est establishing these lower bands here as, as support. Uh, this is very classic wave magic kind of stuff. Um, this thing could shoot off to the top or, you know, it could kind of stay here in these bands because this thing has rolled over already. I would expect. I wouldn't expect that Bitcoin price is just going to immediately try and shoot to the top side for 80,000. It's probably going to take some uh, some whiffling, some waffling in the price before it actually decides to make another macro move. Um, maybe like so, for example, this is one way things could play out. Um, oh, and also I drew this line here. This line doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, it's just, again, it's a point of reference. Breaking this line would be good. It would say, hey, you know, all right, things are looking um, slightly more positive than negative. At the moment, you might still say, hey, this thing could could hypothetically roll over. Typically, from a statistical standpoint, like what I normally see with these charts, that shouldn't happen here, especially since the broad mentality is bullish. The macro is still bullish. There's still liquidity in the system. Um, most likely, I think, would be some kind of like stabilization, break this line, maybe get back up here into these um, 
into these upper standard deviation bands, right? The blue bands take a pullback, right? Collapsing volatility. And then at some point here, maybe, uh, maybe later a week from now, two weeks from now could, could even be three weeks from now, right? After establishing some kind of, um, stabilization, maybe make a break back to the upside here. Um, or it could break to the downside, right? Cause that's, that's really what collapsing volatility tells you. It says, Hey, another big move is coming. You're not exactly sure which direction, um, it's going to be, but collapsing volatility tells you that there's like this compressing action, like a spring and that the market is going to basically move at some point. Um, you know what, uh, also a quick note here, guys, I am watching the YouTube comments, uh, today. So if, um, if you guys have any questions or want me to look at uh, anything in particular, shout out on the YouTube comments and, uh, and we'll pull it up. Um, so, okay, that's the Bitcoin price. Um, and, you know, Bitcoin is kind of like a proxy for the rest of what the market is doing. Um, but let's take some, let's take a little bit more of a look here at Ethereum because uh, there's some interesting, <laughs> there's some interesting things that have happened with Ethereum this week. Uh, let's start with their warrant canary. So they removed their warrant canary. And if, if you don't know what that is, a warrant canary is basically when an open source project, um, we know that the Fed boys will sometimes try and infiltrate and try and force projects to backdoor their code. It's like the the famous Linus Torvalds when he was on stage. Um, this was like, I don't know, like six years or seven, eight years ago now. But someone asked him, they said, hey, have you ever been contacted by a three-letter agency to put a backdoor into the Linux kernel? And he said no as he shook his head yes uh, and smiled. And so everyone laughed. Um, and, you know, it's really probably not really a laughing matter, but his response uh, was was pretty funny. Anyways, the point is that a warrant canary says, as a project, as, a, as the leader of a project, uh, an open source project, we have never um, been contacted by a three-letter agency uh, or, or a government or whatever um, to produce records or to put a backdoor in our code or, or any kind of like coercive kind of thing. We've never been hit with a court or to produce information under gag. So when they gag you, it's like, you have to give us this and you're not allowed to tell anyone that, uh, that we came to you, right? So they literally um, censor your speech and, and, and tell you you're not allowed to talk about it, which is obviously um, contrary to just simple basic human rights, but we're dealing with criminals. So a warrant canary is something that you put up and you keep it on your website and you keep it on your website. And if it disappears, people start saying, why, why didn't they update their warrant canary? It's almost kind of like a dead man switch for having been contacted for the government. Cause you didn't technically say that we've been contacted. You just failed to update your previous speech, which says that you have not been contacted. There's a lot of debate about whether that is truly will work or not. And whether or not the court can just order you to continue doing your warrant canary. Um, they might run into some kind of like, um, free speech lawsuits if they tried to, to go that far. Anyways, um, also on their website, they basically said we, for a long time, they've been saying that they have continued posting on their, uh, I think it was their, their repo, you know, their repository. We have not, um, we have not, <laughs> no governments have made any requests uh, or made any um, uh, gag orders on us for information. And then they removed that. Uh, the Ethereum Foundation removed that recently. So um, effectively, the speculation, the reporting going on is that the SEC is now um, issuing, I don't know if it's subpoenas or demands for information. I don't know the correct legal term here, but effectively the government and the, S the SEC has been issuing to a number of different organizations um, demands for records uh, regarding Ethereum. And the the suspicion is, the reporting is, there's, and we're going to talk about this, I'm going to rant about this here in a second, but the reporting is that Ethereum um, is going to encounter some kind of action for the SE from the SEC for being an unregistered security. <laughs> now that's that's the wrong way to say it, by the way, but that's the news. Um, so the reality, we there, there's like you could look at this from a number of different layers. The pleb layer says, "Oh my God, the SEC is going to attack Ethereum because Ethereum is a security." Uh, and, and they're going to shut that shit down. Like if we're the maximalists, we're like, ha ha, we told you so. And they're, you know, these, these status, the, these maxi status are going to be like, yeah, well, you know, we told you that it was a security and Bitcoin was designed to not be a security, whatever. Okay. Let's, let's take a step back here. Um, and let's really analyze the totality of the situation. Um, this is going to take a minute. So I apologize, Doug, if I, <laughs> if this is going too long, you know, just step in there, let me know. It's fine. Um, but I really want you guys to understand what's what's going to play out here um, on a number of different levels, what's most likely to play out here. Let's take a step way back. Um, in the beginning was the word. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to go that far back. We're not going to Putin this shit. <laughs> okay, so 
let's let's take a step back and understand what is Howie. What's the Howie test, right? Howie was this orange grove in Florida back, I think it was in the 30s. I probably have that time frame wrong, but Howie was an orange grove where this company, they had an orange grove and they were selling particular orange trees to investors. And this company would tend the trees and they would harvest the oranges and sell them and then return a profit to the investors. This was back in the days like when the SEC was just starting to get, you know, I think they had just been formed or something, the Security and Exchange Commission. And so um, there was this case over the Howie orange groves and it went to the Supreme Court. I believe it was the Supreme Court. And what came from that was the Howey test. The Supreme Court said that investors contributed money to a common pool with the expectation of profit from the managerial efforts, solely from the managerial efforts of others. Right? They, they, they submitted money to a common enterprise with the expectation of profit solely from the managerial efforts of others, specifically the, the Howey company or whatever. So... All of those conditions must be met for something to be an investment contract. So when we say something is a security, really what you're saying is an investment contract was sold. So this company sold investment contracts to people that bought orange trees, um, but all of the managerial effort was done by this company to return a profit. So the court said that was an investment contract, and thus it is subject to the regulations of, uh, of the Securities and Exchange Commission. That is a security, as we now call it. Okay, so... All of those conditions have to be met. Let's fast forward to the Ripple case that happened. Uh, summary judgment was released on the Ripple case last year, or maybe it was early this year. I think it was last year. Anyways, summary judgment was released, and Judge Torres ruled that XRP tokens themselves are not a security. However, the company, Ripple, did sell investment contracts to the initial investors, right? Those initial investors gave Ripple, the company, money a common pool, a common enterprise with the expectation of profits from the managerial efforts of what Ripple would do for the marketing, what they would do for the for their uh, for their chain, or if you want to call it a chain, uh, for their servers, <laughs> whatever. Um, and if you think back to Howie, this makes sense because the the orange trees, the oranges in Howie were not the investment contract. They were the object of that contract, but they were not the investment contract itself. And so Judge Torres... Uh, probably what will end up being a landmark ruling for all of crypto since it was such a major case that went on for so long for one of the largest cryptocurrencies market cap in existence. She said the tokens and the network themselves are not securities. Um, but, but Ripple did sell investment contracts, right? So in the same way, the Ethereum Foundation did a 60% pre-mine before they launched. They sold 50% or sorry, they, they sold out of the 100% of tokens <laughs> in ETH. They pre-mined 60 they sold 50% of those to the market. They kept 10%, and then the rest of the tokens got mined with proof of work and now proof of stake. Okay, what happened is Ethereum sold investment contracts to the people that bought the pre-mine on Ethereum. Those were investment contracts. However, Ethereum as a network and as a token is not an investment contract. It's not a security. That's that like the SEC has absolutely no leg to stand on if they're going to want to say that maximalists that don't understand the law have no leg to stand on when they try to say stupid shit like that because it's it's just wrong it's fucking wrong that is not like that's not what the judges and legal people have said okay i'm an anarchist i don't care about regulations but i do respect the power of the people that have them so i try to like i understand their power i try to know my enemy i try to learn about them right so i'm putting on my legal hat here so so if you're out there saying that you know oh body anarchist is not really not a real anarchist trademark um, that's not the case here. It's just that you need to know your, you need to know your enemy. You need to know how they think you need to understand that system. If you're going to play in that system at all, especially if you want to like defeat that system. Okay. So that is my rant on ETH. Now that's like, that's, that's the legal level of analysis. Okay. What's going to happen most likely with the Ethereum ETF now that they're filing for it. And now that they're being attacked is something very similar to what happened with the Bitcoin ETF, because let's be real. Ethereum has massive trad bro investment. They have massive, um, like just massive uh, TradFi investments of all kinds of sorts. Like they've, they've got all kinds of um, people interested in this, uh, including BlackRock, which we'll get to that hilarious story in a little bit as well. I guess it's going to be ETH, ETH heavy today on the uh, on the price report. Um, okay, so um, what's going to happen? What happened with the Bitcoin ETF? They released two ETFs for one, and then they had all this legal fights in between the first ETF and the second ETF, and like they had to sue the SEC and you know capricious and uh, for for acting capriciously. Um, and then ultimately after the battle was the hard fought battle was won, 
uh, the the true Bitcoin spot ETF emerged victorious, and uh, and now maximalist laser eyes can ride into the sunset, um, successfully having integrated uh, their coin into the statist paradigm. Good for them, I guess, and their number went up. Good. So the point of all that is that Gary Gensler spent years at MIT talking good about cryptocurrency, mostly. Um, although he did mention that a lot of more securities, but he also specifically said a lot of these are not securities. They don't qualify, blah, blah, blah. And then he gets into the SEC and he's like, they're all basically securities except for like, I guess, Bitcoin. <laughs> and now they're going to try and allegedly they're, they're going to try and sue, sue the Ethereum Foundation. And by the way, they are probably going to slice some bacon off the Ethereum Foundation's back. Uh, I don't know if there's any bacon to be sliced off of Vitalik's back. He's a pretty thin guy. Anyways, uh, <laughs> yet I digress. They're probably going to be able to say, hey, you guys sold investment contracts. You owe us money now. And they're going to be like, all right, here's some money because they've got billions and billions of dollars. But if they take this to court, the Ethereum is not going to be ruled a security as like a network as a token. But they're probably going to they're probably going to get their pound of flesh from the Ethereum Foundation. What I'm really getting at here is that there was this whole like fake fight that was generated by crypto insiders and Gary Gensler. They knew what they were doing. They knew exactly that they they knew from the beginning they were going to launch two ETFs. They knew they were going to launch a futures based ETF that wasn't a spot based ETF. They knew they were going to have these legal battles. They knew they were going to have the double hype cycle. They knew they were going to be able to do this the whole time. Like, do can I can I prove that? No, this is Bowdy Anarchist speculating right here. Of course, obviously I'm speculating, but. This is like this is this is the reality. Okay, this is what they actually did, and they're probably going to duplicate something similar for Ethereum right here. So just know that. Just know that they're going to duplicate that same playbook for Ethereum. They're going to you're going to have these legal fights. You're going to have all the you know the battle, and you're going to have the victory at the end, right? So it'll be instructive to see how big the pullback is after this. I'm um, oh, sorry, after the Bitcoin ETF uh, hype dies down a little bit. Um, today or this week, the past week, we had uh, some of the first major outflows from from the broad uh, ETF, the Bitcoin ETF ecosystem now. Um, this week was the first like major, major outflows that we saw, mostly led by Grayscale. Um, so uh, speak about the patent owned by Reggie Middleton. I'm sorry, I can't actually speak to that. <laughs> I, I know very little about um, Reggie Middleton. I know the name. I've forgotten uh, what I had once read about him uh, back in the day. Um, ho however, you know, if you want to uh, illuminate us, please. Um. Okay, so... <laughs> uh txo utxo uh spelled you know don't worry utxo says vitalik is thin because he practices what he preaches he has been eating their bugs for years that's hilarious bro <laughs> okay um so uh so yeah again uh, i think the ethereum rant here is basically over um they're just going to double the whole charade that they did the legal charade and the hype cycle charade so it'll be instructive to see what happens with the bitcoin etf and how far price pulls back um, but I mean, you need the thing, right? Like in, in terms of cryptocurrency, you need the hype. You need to get people in the, the believers basically milk the laser eyes for about as much as can be milked now. Um, so probably there's going to be this pivot to ETH. Now, in terms of the fact that ETH is being attacked, legally speaking, uh, and it seems to be wanting to try to break down this very, very long line. Let's switch to the weekly here. This is a very long line. All right. It goes all the way back to 2017. Uh, this pleb line right here is uh, really is flirting with getting broken down. Um, and with the attacks happening, you know, that, that, that might actually happen. This line might actually get broken down. It would be amazing actually to watch Ethereum versus Bitcoin fall down to this area. Um, that would be just massive, massive buying opportunity, whether it gets that far, I don't know. Um, but I really just wanted to give you guys the Ethereum rant today on what's happening because there actually was a decent amount of news on Ethereum. Uh, the last of which here, <laughs> so much, so much news here. The last of which was BlackRock, uh, and, uh, uh, Anon, Anon Mon mentioned this earlier in the comments. He said that, um, uh, that basically BlackRock had launched um, a uh, BlackRock launched a hedge fund on Ethereum and and has a like an Ethereum token associated with it. Um, they also launched like a stablecoin, I believe. So the, they called the BlackRock called their um, their Ethereum token um, the BlackRock USD Institutional Digital Liquidity Fund or BUIDL Biddle uh, for an acronym. It was hilarious because they they released this thing. And then they just immediately started getting trolled with like Pepe memes, tornado cash outputs. So now like they're <laughs> that address is now tainted with tornado cash outputs. Um, some guy registered big dick think dot ETH. Larry Fink is the guy that owns BlackRock. <laughs> so they registered an Ethereum domain uh, domain name for <laughs> for big dick think, I guess. Um, and yeah, apparently they made like 
I think a few hundred thousand, maybe it was even a million dollars somehow that got sent <laughs> that had nothing to do with BlackRock, just got sent as like trolling shit um to their new to their new um liquidity fund or their their new uh, hedge fund on Ethereum. Uh so yeah, that was pretty funny. Um <laughs> I think with that, yes. Yeah, so Let's touch here real quick, though, on on the tornado cash outputs, because now like they got tainted by tornado cash. And it's like, well, a company as large as BlackRock is probably going to do some kind of filings with the government. Say, hey, by the way, you know, some this was us. We got sent some fucking some taint. We got sent some taint that stinks on uh, onto our contract here. You know, please don't um, you know, this is full disclosure. And, and probably there's some like legal means carved out of of making like so, so that their whole fund isn't now like you know, going to end up in court or uh, Larry Fink going to jail, right? Like to, to, to think that some small amount of taint that you had nothing to do with now uh, for a company that big is actually going to defeat them. And people thinking that chain analysis can be defeated just by tainting other people's addresses. That's um, it's a bit silly. It's a bit juvenile. That's not really like how the real financial world and the legal world work. Um, but uh, yeah, okay. I guess that's enough talking about Ethereum. <laughs> Ethereum on the Monero Talk podcast. Sorry for that that deviation there, guys. But that that was that to me that was the big news that happened. Um, so, ooh, okay. Uh, let's see. So we talked about Bitcoin. We talked about Monero. Talked about the Ethereum news. Um, we're still looking here at the Bitcoin dominance hovering uh, right just above fifty percent. Um, I'm still like before before calling the fat lady having sung on this recent run up and expecting some major larger pullback i really really want to see altcoins run i think everybody wants to really really see altcoins run before the pullback happens so that might be a good enough reason for why it doesn't uh but uh, i can't really you know i can't really say that it's just a note in my mind that i would say hey okay keep that in mind that you know that's that might be important um stocks Past week made another little all time high. That's the NASDAQ. Sorry, let me zoom in here. Um, this is the SP. So you'll notice actually on, on a slightly longer time frame, we've got this big channel here with the SP uh, kind of touched up here. This, this, what you would call a resistance, a rising resistance line. Um, yeah, I mean, but at the same time, if we extend this channel up here, uh, you know, Ethereum, uh, Ethereum, sorry, the SP still has room to run there. So uh, new highs for the S&P, for the NASDAQ. Something I've noticed for the past like six months now is that they don't go up together anymore. Like you'll see stocks pump while crypto hangs out or maybe pulls back. And then you'll see crypto pump as the NASDAQ and the S&P kind of uh, cool off a little bit. So they sort of they sort of counter pump like overall, you know, on the weeks long time frame, the months long time frame, they are going up together. But like in terms of like, day to day, it looks like they kind of counter pump, right? One will pump while the other pauses and the other will pump, um, you know, while, while the other one pauses. So that's, uh, that's stocks. Um, yeah, we don't need to look any further on that one. Uh, we'll just look at some of the macro stuff and be done. Call it a day. Uh, this is the reverse repos, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it looks like, again, it's still kind of like curving down. I think they're going to try and stretch this as long as they can. Um, going into the election, that seems like what they're looking at, which would kind of signal a Biden win, right? That's that's what that would signal. A Biden win means stability. I know that people don't want to hear that, but a Biden win basically means stability for financial markets, um, or and probably lower lower chances of tail risk. Usually, usually they'll they'll do some kind of changing of the guard associated with a big tail risk, right? Um, like when when Biden got into office, that's when Trump had initiated the COVID bullshit. Oh shit! I can't. I always say that fucking word. I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. I need to put a big note, sticky note on my desk that says, "Don't say this word." Um, anyway, so they did all that stuff, and then Biden came in, right? And he's like, "Well, I'm just fixing the mess." Like they always do that. Oh, I'm just fixing the mess of the last guy, right? Uh, so if Biden wins, if the plan is for Biden to win, probably like some level of financial stability should be expected. Um, gold made another all-time high on Thursday. It looks like uh, two thousand two hundred twenty-four dollars. Okay, cool. Um, gold is gold is doing relatively okay now. Really, really was uh, kind of stuck for a long time while markets were, were really pumping. But that's that's just what gold does. Okay, let's see. I don't think there's anything else. Uh, we got the Dixie again. Dixie's just kind of hanging out, holding pattern, compressing volatility. Um, not too important at the moment. Although you'll notice, um, you know, as Dixie pumped, crypto pulled back a little bit for the past week. Okay, um, it's not perfectly co anti correlated, but it's slightly anti correlated. Um, I guess, uh, nothing happened with bonds. It's funny cause bonds actually look similar to Dixie in the sense that it's just kind of like this compressing volatility pattern for the past year, maybe year and a half. 
um, which is unsurprising, right? Dixie and bonds are, are definitely the dollar index and bonds are, are related to each other. Uh, let's see. Oh, last thing, you know what? There was a Fed meeting that happened. Um, Jay Powell got up there and said some stuff. Nobody cared. Um, like it was boring. It was droll. There was just nothing important. Something about lowering rates maybe later this year being data driven. They care about the people and they care about inflation and employment. Uh, so yeah, nothing important happened. Um, with with the J Powell uh, meeting, they didn't raise rates. He he said they're probably done raising rates for the cycle. Um, so yeah, rates are steady. Uh, and let's take a look at the Monero prices uh, uh, transaction counts, just because you know obviously that's that's the big news in our mind. Um, I I don't have the means to analyze this. I really <laughs> maybe if I like spent about a month um, learning the statistics that I would need to really analyze the Monero transaction counts. But eyeballing this chart. Um, it does look like what's happening here is some kind of a different signature. This like just with your eyeballs, this looks like a different pattern than what we've seen here with this like kind of uh, sawtooth oscillation for really for years. Um, I, I I would be interested to see what maybe Rucknium or some of the other guys that really understand how to analyze this say. Um, I I want to see. I would very much love to see this thing crash down to like sixty thousand transactions and do some weird sawtooth action. Um, because it seems like other cryptos, like that's what happens. You get like weird sawtooth action where you get like spikes of transactions and then no one uses it for a couple of days and then everyone uses it again. Like right now, this is high and it's just staying high, right? We're like well above 100,000. So 110, like basically between 130 and 110,000 transactions um, per day. I, I feel like if it crashed down, like that would be like, all right, there's no one like attacking the chain, right? No one's trying to like poison outputs or whatever. But if you if you go high and then you stay high, it's like uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know what the math is or the st statistics. I've heard nine to one, like they need to own basically ninety percent of the outputs to deterministically unwind the chain. But um, how much can they? Um, like how much how much does it improve their probabilistic um, uh, output tracking if they own say one third of the outputs or if they own like seventy percent of the outputs? Right, I'm sure that that helps. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's just kind of, we're just looking at the transaction counts. That's like my personal thoughts. There are no conclusions that I, that I draw from that. It's just kind of like me thinking out loud. Um, but at any rate, we're still above, well above a hundred thousand transactions. Um, it seems like Monero, the network works just fine. You know, I sent a transaction or two in the past week. So it seems like, uh, seems like everything's still working there. Um, and with that, I, I don't think I've got anything else to show you guys today. So what, uh. Let Mr. Pseudo, Mr. Tuman, come back on and All take right. it away. All right, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Thanks, guys. Um, Tux, any any questions? Anything you anything you got? Not for me. Just always enjoy listening to Body's take on the market. He's he's always ten steps above everyone else in that regard. <laughs> Thanks, bro. Um, Zano, can, can 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 you take a look at that one? We talk uh, about that know, sometimes, and th this week it like it, it yeah, pumped me, with me, the uh, with the f with their upgrade. I'm writing that down right now because uh, yeah, we should start covering Zano. We should like look at the price of Zano every day. I mean, every time we do the price report now, it's yeah, it's too mean, super small cap. Oh, it's a Z. Oh, of course. Mex C and Coinex is that really the only place to trade on? Let's look at Coinex because Mex C are scumbags. Um, <laughs> All right, we're on the weekly. Let's go to the daily. Yeah, those are gains. Lately, 50%. Getting some pullback here. Uh, let's take a look at the wave magic. Let's see what the wave magic says. I mean, and the we volume go down is to lower time frames. so low, right? I mean, it's it's a very small cap coin. Yeah, let's put up the volume here, too. So Xano currently being $3.85, and then we're... Let's pin the uh, move to... Bring that to the saying, uh, wow, narrow, yeah, that wow, narrow was pumping like crazy, I think, because it's getting added to cake. I don't know if there was other reasons as well. I'll I'll refrain from sharing my opinion on wow, narrow, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hey, I, I just don't, don't like it. Uh, like, there's already speculative degeneracy. Oh, okay, it might serve some interesting use cases from an arrow in the sense that, like, uh, some it's people nice call it a test net, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, we have it a is just net, a silly but... meme coin, but it is funny to me that it still has more usability than, I mean, most coins do because it has all the same privacy features Monero does. Do they? It's just mine? dangerous. 
No, I don't think so. Yeah, that that would that would that would be a nice redeemable feature to have. I don't think they if do, they merge right? mine, I could like give them some leeway. Exactly. No, I don't believe they do. Like Monero Bros don't need to be dumping on each other speculatively in in the Wow Narrow like forum. We there's so much other degenerative speculative bullshit out there that yeah, that, that's what, that, merge mine. Yeah, that's what I don't like about it. Like you see, like some some people like you know obviously really jumping on the on the pump wagon, and then it's always like, oh, it's just a joke, it's just a meme coin. Yeah, but you're you're misdirecting people, so I I don't like to to support that really. That being said, while Nero will be at Monerotopia, they were there last year, uh, and they'll be here again this year. Um, I think in an even more official capacity, uh, they'll be giving a talk. So, hmm. on memes? No, I'm just, just logo. I, I, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> uh, the essentially the founder of of Wild Nero will hmm. yeah. will be uh, yeah. He runs the uh, cryptocurrency trading subreddit. We're good friends. Yes. He's, he's, oh, is is that? Are you being uh, facetious? Facetious there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's he's see. A if good there's guy. more. I mean, my 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 interactions have always been 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 great. He's. Uh, I like John. I'm sure he's a friendly guy. I have no doubt about that. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I don't, I don't know what your what your uh, drama has been over there, but yeah, but I do I do agree with you. I like you know hesitate to give it attention because it gets amu- uh, abused. Um, and you got, you know, it's, it turns into a pump and dump. So much more interested in projects that really kind of give back to the ecosystem in very real ways. I think it's cool that while Nero does implement the tech that, that minute, uh, that Monero is working on faster, you know, cause it really doesn't care if things work or not. Um, so as a test net, I do think that's cool. But, uh, you know, people out there that are saying like, well, Nero is going to flip Monero, like, I know you're having fun. You're just trying to pump your bags. Do people actually say that? Yeah, obviously on Twitter, you know, people see their coin going up. But, you know, everything goes out the window at that point. Uh, you know, they, they just start, they just try to pump it. Um, and I, I just hate, hate the feed into that in any way. I mean, it's just, it's just horrible. I just have a heart. Like, WoW is not a meme. I don't see WoW anywhere out there in the Twitter ecosystem except for, like, Monero-related people. So... Like Dogecoin is known by plebs that don't even play in crypto. Wow is not like this meme, like this dog meme that draws people in, at least not from what I can see. Like maybe, maybe I'm, I'm obviously no one can see the entire market at once, but uh, I just don't see any reason to think that, that the wow meme brings people into Monero. It's, it seems mostly to be meme, like the niche meme, meme market people and, and Monero people. Time. Right, it's it's just bringing in Monero people to WoW, <laughs> right? Like it's like that. That's that's a very good point. And then they're just gonna dump it and get more Monero. So, so uh, be careful. Looking... Be careful. Don't be on the side of the dump, guys. So looking at the uh, the Xano chart here, it this is on Mexi, and then the situation seems to be about the same on Coinex, which are the only two exchanges I saw here. Um, they're trading about ten thousand, uh, sorry, thirty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars a day. Um, on each exchange, so that's and a hundred thousand would be like your max. So it's, I mean, really, it's trading about thirty to fifty thousand dollars of total volume per day. That's really, really low. <laughs> that's that's very, very low liquidity volume. However, um, people should under like when you say, oh, it's low liquidity. That's just a low liquidity shitcoin. Okay, understand that the lowest when Bitcoin was at its lowest liquidity, it had its highest price gains, because when there is no liquidity and people suddenly decide I want to buy this thing, they're the price goes vertical, right? Because something has to give. And when there's no liquidity, the only thing that can give is price. So your highest potential for gains are when the liquidity is the lowest, um, particularly when the sell side liquidity is the lowest to be as specific as possible. But um, anyways, yeah, I mean, you could you could, you could could pick up some Xano here. Maybe um, actually I made a mental note uh, well, and, a, and a real note to, um, to at some point here, I think it's probably worth a punt, right? It's worth to pick up some Xano, probably worth it to pick up some. Dar- DarkFi hasn't launched anything yet, right? So, but whenever DarkFi does launch, it's launch i mean probably just best to mine it right that's they're going to merge mine with monero so um let's see someone asked about darrow yeah darrow actually did perform um recently let's take a look at CoinX, i guess darrow volumes are hang on a second here gonna move the volume ticker down 
All right. So Dero <laughs> volumes look to be about five times. Wow, those are low volumes for, but that's CoinX. There's got to be better volume somewhere else. All right. Well, let's just forget about volume for a moment and just take a look at the price. Yeah, Dero had a nice pump here. Um, pump to the up to, to its upper standard deviation limits. That's about two and a half X that it made. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it was probably due, right? Like at some point, I think someone asked about it like a few months ago and I said, Hey, you know, who knows, right? Unless you really, unless you really know, um, or are in the know, but I mean, you know, I mean, all shit coins have been pumping lately. Like right? Bitcoin set new all time highs. It, it is the time to expect uh, mm -hmm. various coins to pump. We talked about Darrow a number of times here and why we're kind of suspicious and we don't really, but you know, I mean, they'll, they'll be at Monerotopia, as you said, they'll, they'll be, will they be predicting? Well, no, I, I don't know. I mean, if Darrow wants to reach out to us, you know, um, if they want to participate in Monerotopia and be a privacy tech sponsor, um, I mean, we have Wow Nero. Why wouldn't we have Darrow, right? And uh, my my understanding is they are doing some some interesting things with tech. I really don't know the project at all. Um, but yeah, you know, given the nature of Monerotopia, we're we're open to projects coming, and then we benefit because they contribute, right? So that's what keeps the conference super cheap. That's what allows us to have a budget to fly in speakers from all over the world. So if they want to come contribute, uh, purchase a sponsorship as a privacy tech project, would uh, would certainly be open to that. But that's up, you know, up to so them. So Florida, Florida asks, can anyone speak to its utility? How does it compete with Monero? What does Darrow have that XMR does not? Um, really basically, Darrow's claim to fame is um, homomorphic encryption, right, where you can perform uh, mathematical operations on some encrypted data. It, it's kind of like how in Monero you can prove that um, the sum of the inputs and the outputs equals zero without revealing the actual um, the actual amounts there. Uh, but homomorphic encryption is like more complete in the sense that you can do like a more like a more complete mathematical operation on encrypted data. Um, there's the the thing is, and I don't know enough about it because I really haven't looked into Darrow that much. But guys like um, Seth for privacy. Uh, and I think some other guys have have really challenged the level of um, of what Darrow can actually do in terms of homomorphic encryption. Obviously, their developer, and I say their developer singular on purpose, um, they would challenge that. It, it did seem like they had made some questionable decisions, like when Monero was pioneering bulletproofs. Um, before the math out, it was complete. Darrow integrated them into their chain, which is like that's a huge no-no. Like you don't you don't integrate unaudited math into your running chain like that's just wait the few months right just wait a few months until it's done um and then integrate it but uh yeah i mean hey it, you know it does some stuff okay maybe it'll maybe it'll do some stuff for real i don't know i'm more interested in dark i really enjoy the the way they approach and again guys like i i say this i've said this before but like I'm not a developer. I'm not a cryptographer. So what am I going to do? How am I going to make decisions about fucking chains that are like super advanced? Well, I'm going to have to rely on those social cues. I'm going to have to rely on the X, like the sort of peripherally associated things and the way that people conduct themselves. Right. So yes, this is, are you nice? Do you play nice monkey with other monkeys? Okay. But, um, also things like, do you integrate math operations into your chain before the math audit is done? That's a red flag. That's like, yo, like, no, that you shouldn't do that. Um, and I have to look at, you know, all of the other sort of surrounding stuff um, if I'm not going to evaluate that encryption and that code and chain for myself. It's it's like a poor man's way. It's a dumb, it's a pleb man's way of trying to to understand topics for which you're not like sufficiently educated on. Um, or perhaps you don't have sufficiently uh, enough wrinkles on the exterior of your brain to be <laughs> to be able to, to assess. Um, but anyway, so like that's one way that I think is, you know, that you can go about looking at things. I would caution against be, being careful. Like a lot of very smart people are kind of rough around the edges, you know, like we, we have them in Monero too. Like some really cool people that made some really cool shit for the chain um, are a little bit rough around the edges. So like I don't necessarily take the social cues nearly as much as I take um, like their best practices cues, right? If they if they fail to, to implement and meet like certain best practices, um, that, that raises red flags like in a, in a more technical sense. So um, yeah, that's my rant on club level decisions yeah so then you know like about. like one arrow and all the you know super low cap um these things turn into pump and dumps the original question was how about daryl that's getting some buzz from jeff burwick and Raphael. you know jeff burwick and Raphael, great guys but they're kind of infamous for being part of these projects that 
that get pumped and that then dump. We saw it with Pirate Chain. I mean, guys, I think anybody that listens to this show is aware of these general concepts, right? You know, investigate these projects, see if they're they have, you know, strong teams behind them. I mean, how many people are developing on Pirate Chain? It's like one guy. Is it even happening anymore? Is it even being developed anymore? Uh, it completely pumped, completely dumped, and a lot of people lost a lot of money uh, that got turned on to it. Darrow, you know, is that the next pump and dump from the, you know, from from Berwick? I don't know. You know, I, I would, I'd be cautious. I'd be cautious there. You know, make sure you're not buying somebody somebody else's bags, and then you're you're you know you're on the dump side. Um, that's that's my yeah. overall take on those projects. So if I wanted to be as gracious as I could, um, like I, I do, I do regard broadly speaking, um, Anarcha, uh, Anarcha Polko, Berwick, um, Rafael, these guys are allies, right? Like they, oh, they do play with Monero. Like if you're here in Mexico and you want to send these guys Monero, they'll be like, sure, no problem. Like there's, it's, it's like a no brainer for them. Um, and you also have to understand that as you get more popular, you start to influence the market. So like, um, you know, we're kind of like a, a somewhat small show here and probably not that many people listen to um, to my price advice. But hypothetically, if I had 100,000 followers and I started recommending low cap coins that could pump and I genuinely was like, yeah, um, you know, this coin or whatever. right? like I won't say any particular coins, um, but yeah, some low cap coin that that I got into early and I genuinely believe it's going to go up. Well, if I've got 100,000 followers, I can sort of make that happen, even if just by accident. So um, like that, that is like a problem no, but- that you run into. Yeah, but but they are aware of it, right? <laughs> the they crypto vigilante, be. and they're they're very much aware of it. You know, uh, I like I like them too. I love I like I enjoy going. I was down in Arcapoco years ago. Uh, Jeff Burrick closed out Monerotopia last year. I mean, the guy you know is a visionary in terms of liberty. He was very early in Bitcoin. He says a lot of great things. Uh, Raphael, help you know, big part of Monerotopia in years past. Great guy. Um, but they also happen to then, you know, be the guys that like often talk about these small cap cryptos that get pumped and dumped. We saw it with Pirate Chain. We've seen it. BSV was another like BSV. Like why? Why were they so big on BSV? Right? Like so. Raphael is a big BSV guy. Yeah, it's, uh, you know that. You know that. That's what I'm saying. So, so, so be very careful. Do they are they into Monero? Of course, they're into Monero because uh, they would have no credibility at that point, point. Um, and they're uh, into traditional Bitcoin as well. So, yeah, well said. So, we'll leave it at that. And I and I hope they do participate this year. Um, I'm uh, I'm sure Raphael would come down, and uh, he was a, he was a speaker last year. The year before, they helped out with. They ran the virtual conference part of, of the conference. So, we've known Raphael for years, and, and he's he is great. But just be wary of, you know, what gets pushed out there. You don't want to be on the wrong side of a pump and dump. Damn, I'm looking at Pirate Chain here. This is a round tripper. This is what you call a round tripper. The thing <laughs> went from seventeen cents up to like twenty dollars. What was that? Yeah, right around twenty. And it's it basically went all the way back down, like it round tripped all the fuck way back down to its lowest point. Uh, Hex is another one of these coins that did the same thing. I mean, that's um, the purest where... like p- example of a pump and dump, is it not? Yeah, and you I know, mean, if you if you were you know at an Arcapoco over here, you know maybe maybe you were buying it when when they were telling you to buy it, and maybe that's when they were selling it. I mean, this is what a a 90% not not pre-mined trademark registered, not pre-mined gets you. (laughs) You know, like, hey, I know, let's not tell the Monero community, let's not talk to the privacy community, let's launch a chain based on proof of work uh, for which we run basically all of that proof of work for a couple of years and then be like, hey, we really like you guys. Monero is awesome. Also, buy Pirate. Like, okay, but why didn't you talk to us when you launched? Right. (laughs) secret mine not secret i mean it was they still published things like it was still out there in the ether and the internet right but yeah i mean that's that's what happens like when you get such highly centralized supply unless you're very very careful to manage it or get massive attention like ripple ripple did you know they pre mine 100 percent, but they had massive massive attention um, for the entire ecosystem and really really good narratives um we're the banker coin right this is the coin that we made for the banks are going to adopt it that was never true 
there was never real like actual banking partnerships not not like big banks like okay some like nothing bank in some random country maybe but anyways ripple did a really good job with their marketing and and with um you know capturing the the pleb attention and so their 100 percent pre-mine was able to actually perform really good and actually stay really high and be a top market cap coin pirate chain not so much 